Um, for, for those of you who are still finding seats, there's, there's loads and loads of room um, over on this side of the church. So do come and take a seat over here. Wonderful. So if you're coming in now, come take a seat over here and we'll get started. Wonderful. Good morning. Morning, yay, cheers, Noah. Um, <laughs> my, my name's Dylan. I'm a member here at Broadme Baptist Church. It's, it's lovely to have you here today. Your, your first time here or your, your hundredth time here, you're very welcome. Um, I think there's some, some new students who are still trying out different churches. So if you're a student here today for the first time, um, you're very welcome too. Um, there's, a, there's been various notices up on the screen, which I hope you've been um, paying attention to, there's just a couple to specifically mention. Dan, I didn't know if you wanted to mention something. Good morning. Um, so, yeah, so I'm excited to announce that in a couple of weeks' time, so on Thursday, the 26th of October, we're going to have the head of Christian Surfers coming here to Broadmead to give us a talk on uh, the organization, on the charity, uh, what they do, um, and how we can get involved. So, yep, there's a slide there. So, yep, doors are open at 7.30. And we'll go start, sorry, doors are open at 7, start at 7.30. Uh, he'll give us a talk. There'll be time for questions. And then he might even give a little sort of surf lesson at the end if you're interested in surfing. Um, it's not just for surfers or if you like surfing, it's for everyone. Um, I've been to a few events and half the people there say they don't even like surfing. Uh, they just get involved with it. Um, so definitely come along, bring your friends. Um, yeah. And also, small question, if anyone's available around 7 to help kind of be on the doors and welcome people in, then give me a message. That would be really helpful. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Um, and then the only other thing was, um, if we got the slide on about band night this Friday. So if there's band night this Friday, so if you're in the band or you're sort of interested in getting involved in the band, then we're having a, a night where we're going to worship together. Um, just kind of get to know each other a bit better, have a bit of time of devotion and, and opening God's word together. Um, so if you're interested in that, then either come and have a chat with me or Jack. I don't know if Jack's here today. No. So just come and have a talk to me today if you're interested. Um, or any, anyone who you see who, up on the stage or uh, who leads worship usually. Um, grand. I don't think there's anything else I specifically need to mention unless someone shouts at me otherwise. No. Good. Wonderful. Um, so before we start with a time of worship, um, I've just got some questions um, that I just want a bit of help answering at the moment. And what I will say is if you're under the age of 11, you have first dibs on answering these questions. If, if there's no answers after about 20 seconds, then, then adults, you have a chance as well to get involved. Um, and if you're under 11, but you don't have a very loud voice, then you're allowed to get an adult near you to, to shout out the answer. There's no need for hands to shout when you think you know the answer. So Ted, if you're happy to stick the first slide on. So, what's missing from this picture? I hear mutterings from adults, I think, somewhere. Oh. Go on. Color, yeah, color is missing, definitely. <laughs> oh. That wasn't quite what I was going for, but yes, absolutely right. It's an old picture. It gives you a bit of a clue. Yep, go on. The bridge, yeah, exactly, the suspension bridge. Well done. So there's no bridge there. Um, and no color. <laughs> and there's probably lots of other things missing, but we'll, we'll stick for that for a moment. 
Um, can you put your hand up if you've been to the suspension bridge that's usually there before? Pretty much everyone, that's good. Um, how do you think back then when this, when this was, drawing was made, or drew, who, how do you think they got across from one side to another? We'll go first. You can just shout out if you know. Balloon. <laughs> <laughs> this is all going wrong. <laughs> Go on again. By boat, yeah. By boat would be one option. Um, to be honest, I don't think there's really any other options, is there? And if the tide was out, you're really stuck, aren't you? I mean, if you know, if anyone's seen this before, when the tide goes out, there's like no water there really at all. It's just mud. You'd be crawling through mud to try and get there. Um, and uh, if you know, if you had a friend on the other side of of that gap, it's the Avon Gorges. So the river's called the Avon. Um, you know, you wouldn't be able to see them for like ages, and it would take hours and hours to try and get there. The first song that we're singing today, the first line is um. It's got a weird word, and it says, how great the chasm that lay between us. Now, chasm is just a word for a big gap between two places, just like the Avon Gorge. But this song isn't talking about the Avon Gorge, you'll be pleased to know. Um, this song is talking about the gap between us and humanity and between God. Um, in the book of Isaiah, it says, our sins or our wrongdoings have separated us from God. So just like friends on each side of the gorge, they, you know... We are separated from God, and there's no way between. It's like the, the tide is out, there's mud there. There's no way of getting, getting across. But God wasn't happy with, with us being on the other side of the gorge. But how did God make a way to, for us to, to be with him? Go on, you can shout out again. How did God make a way for us to be with him? Jesus, yeah, exactly. It's a classic Sunday school answer, isn't it? But, <laughs> um, but Jesus, it's through Jesus that we, that we have a way to, to, to God. And it's because of Jesus dying on the cross and taking the punishment because of our sin that we deserve, that we can be holy like God. And we have a way to, to be with God. In the Bible, it also says Jesus died for our sins, whether we are good or bad, to bring us to God. We can't, in our own strength, climb through the mud to get to God. It's only by trusting in Jesus that we have a way across. Just like a bridge. Now, some bridges aren't particularly trustworthy. Who would go across this bridge? Put your hands up if you'd go across this bridge. Johnny, <laughs> you're a braver man than me. Anyone else? Who would go along this bridge? Okay, there's a few, wow. Um, who would drive a car across this bridge? No, <laughs> no, anyone? Johnny? No. <laughs> Um, so, so some bridges aren't very trustworthy. And it's difficult to go across a bridge that you don't trust. But actually, what we know, Jesus isn't like this bridge on the picture. We know that Jesus is trustworthy. That actually, if we put our trust in him, that, that we can rely on him and, and we have a way to God through him. That isn't something that's going to crumble as soon as we take a step on it. Um, what we're going to do now I've got a picture of a suspension bridge as well, just in case any of you forgot what it looked like. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to come to a time of, of worshipping God now. And if you're new to church or, or this is something that just seems a bit weird to you, essentially it's about singing. We're singing, going to do worship through singing at the moment. And we're singing praise to God for what he's done for us. Um, so I encourage you now, if we're going to stand um, and I'm going to uh, pray for us as we come to a time of worship. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are trustworthy. And I thank you that you are worthy of our praise. And I pray this morning that as we worship you and we sing to you, that, that our singing will be delightful to you, that you'll take joy in our worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
How much it costs to see my sin upon that cross, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus a name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up. 
Father, I thank you that you're worthy of our praise. You're so worthy of our praise. I pray, may we just more and more build our lives on you. I pray today that as we hear your word spoken to us, as we learn more about you, may you speak to us, and may you change our hearts. May we not leave here today um, the same as we came here. And I pray for the young people that as they leave, um, may you speak to them too. I pray, um, as is the vision of this church, Lord, may not one of them be lost. I pray for the leaders that you'll give them wisdom and knowledge to know what to say, um, to, to encourage them in a life with you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Um, so yeah, the young, young people, um, we'll be going out to their groups now. Oh, sorry. Oh, for the Wadlow Hall. Yeah, so don't go up the stairs, um, the ones, because they're still horrifically unsafe. So you can go up through the balcony or through the Wadlow Hall. Um, and while they're doing that, if you just want to have a chat with someone who sat next to you um, about something that's encouraged you this week,
Wonderful. If you, if you bring those conversations to a, a temporary hold, but I really encourage you to continue those conversations over some coffee after the service. Um, we're, as, as many of you will, will know by now, um, if you've been coming to this church over the last couple of months, I feel like it's one of the main things we've been talking about is the fact that we're, we're starting to do um, a program where we read the whole Bible as a church in two years. Um, and this essentially involves all of us reading um, a, a chapter of the Old Testament and a chapter of the New Testament each day. Um, and then that's been forming the basis of our sermon series that we've been um, having preached to us and also the conversations in home group as well. Um, The reason why we're doing this is because we believe as a church that the Bible is not just a book, but the living word of God. And that as we read it, we learn more about who Jesus is, and in turn, our lives are changed. Um, And as a church, we we want to read for comprehension, but but mainly to read to go deeper um, as a church um, and to respond to the amazing God that we have. Now, some of you, if if you're here for the first time or you haven't been involved so far, do not fear. There's, there's, we really encourage you that if, if you want to, to, to get involved with this, um, there's no, we're not, it's not, there's no pressure, um, but we just think it's a really great thing to be doing as a church. So we do encourage you to do that. If you want to find out more, then on the website, the church website has all of the daily readings on for, for each week coming. So it's easy enough for you to find what, what we're going to be reading. And I'd just like to invite John up. He's going to give us a bit of a flavor of this this coming week. On my way up, I nearly successfully knocked over the same coffee thing for the second time. So, um, um, Yeah, so this week we're, we're reading from Genesis uh, 16 to Genesis 23, um, and that's carrying the story of Abraham to its kind of conclusion. And Abraham is this great man of faith, um, and that story shows us what that looks like. It's about receiving the promises of God with an open hand, and that doesn't make everything easy. Um, it, it really doesn't. There's some pretty gnarly stuff in there some pretty dark stuff that he has to go through but it means that in going through that he knows he is held um, by God so um, as you're reading that look out for the promises that God makes to him and also look look for how Abraham responds to that what his relationship with God is like and then we're also reading through uh, Matthew and that'll take us uh, from Matthew 16 tomorrow and Matthew 16 is like We'll hear all about Matthew shortly. Um, but it's, it's a great turning point in Matthew because it's the moment when the disciples kind of realize that this Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one of Israel. And from that moment, Jesus kind of starts the direction towards Jerusalem and, and the journey towards the cross. And, and in that time, he teaches his disciples what it is to be part of this community. So again, in that, look out for what Jesus says about what's coming. Uh, look out for how, um, how he says we should be disciples. Um, and also just read stories about Jesus. It's great, isn't it? So just, just enjoy what he does and, and, and be always amazed at that. Um, and now Emma is going to come up and read today's passage, uh, one of today's two passages, um, Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. It's not reading. If you want to follow along in a red or blue church Bible, it's page 981. Matthew 15. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God... They are not to honour their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. 
Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see? Whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach, then out of the body. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. These defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the cripple made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he'd given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men, besides women and children. After Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. We're now going to um, spend some time praying together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you so much for who you are. Thank you that you are a God who keeps his promises. Father, you have promised to be with us always, to give us the strength to face each day, to give us freedom from our sin, and you've promised us life, life to the full in Christ. We thank you so much that you are so faithful to us and that we can trust that your promises are true. Help our hearts to praise you in each moment of the day as you are so worthy to be praised. Father, we ask that your kingdom will grow here on earth, that more and more people will come to know Jesus, to know that he died and rose again so that we may have a relationship with you. We ask that they will recognize Jesus as their Lord and Savior and give their lives to him and follow him. We thank you so much for every single person that came to the evangelistic service last week. We ask that eyes were opened to seeing that fitting into this world will never satisfy but belonging to you and being a part of your family through Jesus is the greatest and sweetest thing. We pray that seeds were sown in people's hearts and that people want to come and know more and more about you, Lord. Thank you that ultimately you are the one who reigns, that you are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace. And Father, we ask for peace across the world. Lord, we pray in particular for Eastern Europe with the war between Ukraine and Russia. And we pray this also for the conflict in the Middle East. Father, we cry out for an end to it. Father, we pray for all those affected by conflict, those who've had to flee their homes, move countries, or lose loved ones. Father, please be their comfort and refuge, despite feeling that the world may be in crisis and chaos. Thank you that we know that nothing is outside of your control and that you are a good God. You are the perfect leader who will make perfect choices. And we ask that this truth will give us peace in our hearts and keep our hearts trusting you. 
Lord, we recognize that our hearts are so easily prone to wander and to leave you. Father, help us to see our need for you. Thank you that you have spoken to us through the Bible. Lord, your word is living and active and perfectly true. Thank you that we are reading the Bible together as a church over the next two years. Help us to desire to read it, not to tick a box or do it out of duty, but because we want to spend time with you. We want to hear from you and love you more. Help us to encourage each other to keep reading it. Father, thank you that you have promised to provide for all that we need. And Lord, we pray in particular for Della and the Thomases. Thank you so much for all your provision already. We pray for continued wisdom for Ben and Harriet and the doctors as they consider the future treatment of Della. We pray for a miracle and her eyesight may return. We thank you so much for her and the way you've made her, for her character and her personality, for the strength and the joy that you have given her. And we ask that you'll continue to look after her. Father, we thank you that you have provided a way for us to know you, that you have provided the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Father, we recognize, though, how often we continue to fall short, each and every day, either through negligence or deliberately. We do not love you as we should or as you deserve, and that we love other things more. Father, please forgive us. Thank you that through Christ you provided a way for us to have total forgiveness. And we have total assurance that our sin has been dealt with as Christ triumphantly rose from the grave, showing that he has conquered sin and death. Help us to show the same grace and compassion to others and be quick to forgive those that hurt us. We know that sometimes this can be difficult and painful, so we ask that your spirit will help us. Father, we recognize how tempting it can be to look to other things to give us the life, hope and joy and satisfaction that can only be found in you. That we think that freedom can be found away from you. Please show us how foolish this is. Please keep us from temptation. Please, by your spirit, change our hearts and see that freedom is found only in you and you are the only one worth giving our lives to. Father, we pray for protection against the evil one who would love to draw us away from you. Lord, we thank you that you are the one who has power over the devil and that he has already lost. But Father, we pray in particular for the leaders of Broadmead for Mark and John, the elders and deacons, that you protect them from the devil's discouragement and wicked ways. Father, that by your spirit, you will continue to grow them in knowledge and love of you and keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. Help us as a congregation to encourage them and support them. We pray for this too for Peter and Louise Lynch as they serve you in Bangladesh. Protect them from discouragement for the devil and help them to keep faithfully sharing you with those that they come into contact with. And may your kingdom grow there as you draw people to you. Father, please be with Steve as he explains your word to us. Please, by your spirit, give him clarity of thought to explain the passage faithfully. And please help us to listen well. Please may we be free of distraction and open our eyes and ears to hear what you have to say. Please may we be able to go from here more in love with Jesus and changed by your word. Father, thank you that you hear our prayers, that you delight to hear from your children. Thank you that we can trust and hear. Father, thank you that we can trust you and that you tr love to hear, for, uh, hear from us and care for us. And so we join together to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Um, before Steve comes up and preaches for us, I'm just going to read the passage um, for today. Um, so if you'd like to turn with me to Matthew 11, um, verses uh, 25 to 30. And it should be on page 977 of um, the Church Bibles. And it's also on the screen. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the little children. 
Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is God's word. Um, I'll just pray for Steve um, as he opens God's words for us. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. And I pray for Steve that you'll give him um, wisdom and that your spirit will speak through him, that as he opens the written word for us, that we can um, learn more of the living word. Bless him and bless us now. Amen. expert. Great, good to be here, lovely to see you again and um, let's open the Bible together which is a wonderful thing to be doing. Um, Let's begin with a simple question. Uh, When I say the name Jesus, what comes into your mind? When you hear that word, what do you think? How would you describe the picture you have of Jesus? Uh, Now, there may be many good answers to that question. Uh, Some of those answers uh, are more theological. Um, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the God who became man. He's the sacrifice for our sins. You might think of some of the, the names that the Bible gives him. King, the Savior, the Judge, Teacher. All good answers. Or you might say, I have no idea. But how would you describe him in his character, in his heart? As if I was asking you to describe a a, a friend or, or a family member, what would you say about Jesus in his character? Jesus is loving, stern. Harsh? Fearless? What would you say? What about the one time when Jesus actually describes his own character for us? We've just read it. Jesus describes himself as gentle and humble in heart. Those are the words that he chooses to use about himself. This is how the Lord Jesus speaks about himself. This is what he wants us to know about his nature. This It's the heart he wants us to know, gentle and humble. Okay, hold that thought. This morning, we have a big job on our hands. Uh, As part of the Bible overview, my assignment is the whole of Matthew's gospel. So I hope you brought your lunch and your tea and a sleeping bag. Um... How to preach on a whole book, the longest book in the New Testament at that. Well, we don't have that much time, but here's what we'll do. So we will take an overview of the book and what makes it different, and then we will zero in on the passage we read just now. And I hope it will be clear why we're landing on those particular verses. So Matthew's Gospel, all 28 chapters of it. I guess the first question someone might ask is, Why do we need four Gospels anyway? Four separate accounts of the life of Jesus. Why not just one? Isn't that enough? 
And the answer is that they all give us something a bit different, like four different camera angles on the same story. They all tell the same story, they agree, they don't, they, they don't disagree, but the camera angle is different. Four is good. And, and by the way, you might have heard some people say, well, there were lots of Gospels that circulated in the, in the, in the early days. There were, there were dozens of them. And they were all different, and they, and they were very diverse. And then what happened is that some committee or maybe an emperor um, arbitrarily decided to pick these four because they liked these four, because they were, I don't know, politically favorable or something. And the other Gospels were suppressed. And that's what some people say. It's a big conspiracy. The, the, the New Testament is basically a conspiracy. But like most conspiracy theories, there's actually no evidence for that idea. We can be sure that the early church recognized these four Gospels, and only these four, from very early on. And very soon they were circulating as a set of four. And among the four Gospels, Matthew has always been placed first. This is the Gospel that had the biggest influence on the early church. Rightly or wrongly, they used this one the most. The first book in the New Testament, one page on from Malachi. Let's look at some of the ways that Matthew is marked out from the other Gospels. You can get all this from books, but actually any of us can figure this out. It's not rocket science how Matthew is different. All you need to do is read it, which is exactly what we're encouraging everyone to do. Okay. What do we find? Well, like all the Gospels, the climax is the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And as John was saying, you have that big turning point in Matthew. It comes in chapter 16. In Mark, it comes in chapter 8, where um, the, the, the penny drops, Peter confesses Christ, and then Jesus turns his face to go to Jerusalem. Uh, and and that, that kind of thing is always is in all the Gospels. And the death and the resurrection of Jesus is always the climax. But what marks Matthew out? Let's have a look at some of these, and they'll come up on the slide. First of all, connections with the Old Testament. Reading Matthew, we are deeply aware of the close bonds with what has gone before. This is why it's so appropriate that Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. It starts with a genealogy, a record of Jesus' ancestry. Maybe not very gripping for us, but really important to show his continuity with the past, with the beginnings of the nation of Israel, with Abraham, who you'll be reading about in Genesis this week. And we think Matthew was written firstly for a Jewish audience, but those Old Testament roots are our roots too. More than that, Matthew is very big on fulfilled prophecy. The other Gospels are too, but Matthew really rubs our noses in it when he says constantly, this happened to fulfill what was said by prophet X. If you have a Bible open at chapter 11, look across the page to chapter 12, verse 17, you'll see a good example. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. In other words, the prophet spoke about it, now Jesus is here actually doing it. With Matthew, you can't miss it. Second, Matthew in records a lot of Jesus' teaching, especially in five big blocks, which the other Gospels mostly don't have. References on the screen, I think, chapters 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 10, chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom, chapter 18, chapters 23 to 25. Blocks like the Sermon on the Mount, unique to Matthew, are far more parables than Mark, for instance. Jesus has a lot to teach us in Matthew. Third, Matthew puts a big emphasis on authority and obedience. Um, listen, for instance, to uh, chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. This is the closing paragraph of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus comes to the end of that block of teaching and he says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because... He taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The way to live and prosper, the way of true wisdom in this life is to listen to Jesus and put his words into practice. That's real wisdom, obedience. Otherwise, disaster like a flimsy house with no foundation swept away in one of those floods we've seen around the world recently. Being a disciple and a follower of Jesus means obeying him, doing what he says, and see what the people recognize in him as they listen. He isn't like the teachers they're used to, quoting one opinion against another, going back in a line of teachers. No, he speaks with unmistakable authority, God-given authority that compels obedience. And think about the closing words of the gospel in the Great Commission in chapter 28. Uh, the, uh, the last paragraph of the book, uh, 28, 18 to 20. Uh, then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. That's how Matthew finishes. Again, this is unique to Matthew. And we love these words. And we usually focus on the commands to go into all the world and, and tell everyone about Jesus. The mandate for mission, which is great and important and fantastic. And we need to do that. Or, or we focus on that wonderful promise that I will be with you always. But don't miss that this begins with Jesus' authority. All authority has been given to me, says the Lord Jesus. He has the right to tell us these things. And making disciples means what? Teaching them to obey what Jesus has taught. Being a disciple of his means obedience. So while Mark, for instance, presents Jesus first and foremost as the suffering king, Matthew presents him most strongly as the authoritative teacher. A new Moses, one who takes the law of Moses to a new level and calls us to obey. Um, sorry, this has fallen off the bottom of the slide, by the way. Now, having heard all of that, maybe that all sounds a bit heavy. Ah, you might be thinking, oh, I don't like this, all this about teaching, obedience, and authority. Da, da, da. You might be thinking, why don't we dive back into, into Mark, where we were last year, um, with those fast-moving, fast action-packed narratives, um, or, or, or into John with his wonderful imagery of darkness and light and the I am sayings and all that talk about the Holy Spirit. That sounds much better. Let's go there. Well, remember, the Spirit has given us all these angles into the life and work of the Lord Jesus. He decided that one gospel wasn't enough to display every aspect of what Jesus says and does. But here's the surprise. This gospel, with its reams of teaching and its emphasis on obedience, its uncompromising call, this gospel is the one where Jesus opens his heart to us and invites us to look in. This is where we find perhaps the warmest, the kindest words the Lord Jesus ever speaks to his people, to us. And they come in the passage that we read in Matthew chapter 11. And you might have been surprised with the whole book to look at, but I picked just six verses. But this is where we're going to zero in this morning. So. 
Uh, I think the other slides should be okay, actually. Um, just that first one was a bit crowded. Um, so, page 977 of the Church Bibles. Let's have a look at this. The crucial verses here, 28 to 30, are found only in Matthew's Gospel. It's the only place in the four Gospels where Jesus talks about his own heart. And in many ways, these verses summarize the message of Matthew. So it's especially good place for us to go today. We asked at the start, how do you picture Jesus? His character, his heart. Well, look no further. You want to know Jesus? This is the place. And we'll look at these verses now under two simple headings. First, look at the Lord Jesus. Look at the Lord Jesus. Look first at his intimate relationship with the Father there in verse 27. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. We see God the Father and God the Son in close and loving harmony, utterly united as they know each other and delight in each other. In verse 25, Jesus the Son praises his Father for his great plan of salvation. I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. The, the, the way to know him can't be figured out by human intelligence, can't be worked out by study. It doesn't require a top education to work it out. In fact, that does no good at all. No, Jesus says the way has to be revealed to us. And the people who find the way to God are the ones who come simply like children, like little children. Praise ye, Father, for that. And we also see, verse 27 again, that the only way to know God is through Jesus the Son. There's no other way, no other prophet, no other teacher, no philosophy. Just one unique person, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the way to the Father. Knowing God is about meeting a person, this person. We find all this here in these verses. And then come closer and, and look at his character. Look at his heart. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. There's a book which some of us have read. It's this gentle and lowly. It's called, takes its title from this verse, all about the heart of Jesus as we see it in this verse. I'd certainly recommend this book, Gentle and Lowly. It has a wonderful subtitle, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. That's us. Here's what the author says near the start. In the one place in the Bible where the Son of God pulls back the veil and lets us peer way down into the core of who he is, we are not told that he is austere and demanding in heart. We're not told that he is exalted and dignified in heart. We're not even told that he's joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, his surprising claim is that he is gentle and lowly in heart. And my friend, is that your picture of Jesus? Is that how you think of Jesus? If you're at all like me, you have often thought of Jesus as someone who probably doesn't like you very much. I mean, why should he? What is there to like about me? Someone who gets pretty fed up with my failures and my foolishness. But the Jesus who invites us in here says that he is gentle and humble or lowly. This is the heart character of the Lord Jesus. And here too we find the Old Testament fulfilled because the Old Testament prophets talked about the one who would come in just these terms. Listen to that Isaiah reference just across the page in chapter 12, 17 to 21. Jesus says, 
This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. It's from Isaiah 42, one of the songs about the servant of the Lord, the one he will send to bring hope and salvation to the earth. Look there at verse 20. People who are described as broken or bruised reeds, like a plant with a, broken, with a half-broken stalk so that it can't support its weight. It's drooping. It's, it's bowed down. It has no strength. It's useless. And Jesus does not break it. Instead of breaking a person like that, Jesus will support them so that they can stand. Do you feel like a a bruised reed, a broken plant this morning? Jesus, it's for you. Or, Or people like the smoldering wick of a candle that their light and their energy all but extinguished, all that is left is like a puff of smoke. And the servant, the Lord Jesus, will not pinch out that last spark of life. Instead, he will bring justice, he will bring victory, and he will bring hope for the nations. He is gentle. And do you remember the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem a week or so before he's crucified? And do you remember the prophecy from Zechariah about the coming king? Mark doesn't quote it, but Matthew does. It's in chapter 21, verses 4 and 5. This took place, here we go again, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The conquering king arrives in his capital city, but he's not riding a war horse. He's not coming with violence. He comes in peace. This king is humble and gentle, so he rides in on the back of a donkey. King, yes, but what a king. And so humble, so humble that he will go into that city. He will go all the way to the cross, the place of maximum humiliation, offering no resistance at his trial, no resistance at his execution, gentle and humble all the way to his death for us, opening that way to God that only he can provide. This is Jesus' heart for us, his people who love him and embrace him. This is for us wonderful news. But careful, this is not for everyone. Look just a few lines back from our passage and you will find words like these in chapter 11, verse 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his Miracles have been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Jesus has been preaching in his home country, in his own territory. He's been offering himself to them and the people have not responded not recognized him, not obeyed. And what does he do? He warns them of judgments. Jesus' gentleness is not for those who reject him. It is for those who follow him. And so that brings us on to point two. Secondly, follow the Lord Jesus. Look again at verses 28 to 30. Come to me. 
all you who are weary and burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is Jesus' beautiful invitation, and it is here for us to accept or reject. Who exactly is he inviting? Who is this for? All you who are weary and burdened. Put your hand up if you ever feel weary and burdened. It's all right. Yeah, okay, good. Anyone, (laughs) anyone who is weighed down by the worries and burdens of this life. And isn't that all of us? For the people Jesus is talking to, At that time, life is brutally hard. Many of them live hand-to-mouth, dependent on on a daily wage out in the fields if they can get it, and paying a crushing load of taxes after that. And their religious leaders don't make it any easier, as as we'll see in a minute. Life for us, mostly daily life, is a lot easier. But we're not free from worries and burdens about our families, about our future, about our health. The fear of death has not gone away. Our work, our friends, even today, maybe about our identity. More and more, our culture expects us to construct our own identity for ourselves, and it calls that freedom. But that's not freedom. It's a crushing burden. So come, follow him, all you who are weary and burdened. Will we admit that that's us? Come and meet the Lord Jesus. He invites you. And what does he offer when we come? I will give you rest. And again, verse 29, you will find rest for your souls. What kind of rest? is that. You see, it's not rest for your body. Uh, Jesus isn't saying, if you follow me, I can offer you a life of relaxation on the sofa. The Christian life is never going to be an unending round-the-world cruise. In fact, a truly Christian life is likely to be busy and active, but he is offering something far better. Rest for your soul. This Rest, it could be translated relief from those heavy burdens. Could be translated, I will refresh you. Like cold, clear water on a baking hot, thirsty day under the sun. He's offering us a place of still, quiet peace at the heart of our being. There's a couple of points here that help us to understand this better. One is that Jesus talks about sharing his yoke, not an egg yoke, but a yoke that a farmer would put across the shoulders of a pair of oxen or horses. We might get a picture of it. There we are. The yoke was like a heavy bar that was connected to the plow or some great load that these beasts of burden had to drag painfully across the ground. Normally, a yoke implies hard, grueling work. That's the image. But Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because when you're with Jesus, you're in a team with him And you're joined to him, yes, but he's the one who's carrying the load. Do you get the picture? He is the one who takes the strain. He's holding out the offer, remember, to everyone who is struggling under the burden of living in this world. An easy yoke. Learn from me, yes, I have much to teach you. I have a way for you to follow, but it is not a burden. And that brings us to the second point, which is the contrast we see as we move into chapter 12. Look at the first couple of verses there. What happens as we go straight on from this passage? At that time, Jesus went through the cornfields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to eat some ears of corn and eat them. 
When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. What are they doing? That's so terrible. You can't walk innocently through the fields and munch on a few grains of corn. Not on the Sabbath. That's working. Move on to chapter 23, and we can see this even more clearly. This is Jesus talking about the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and the teachers. Are you going to get to chapter 23 this week? Yes. Okay, you will read this on about Saturday? Something like that. Um, chapter 23, this is what Jesus says. This whole chapter is full of Jesus denouncing the religious leaders and the way they taught religion. Verse 4. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, like that yoke, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Their religion was a heavy, cumbersome load, a burden. The exact opposite of what Jesus has been offering in chapter 11. And that leaves us with this, th these two pictures, the rest that Jesus is offering and, and the burdens that were being placed on people's shoulders by their leaders. Jesus calls us to obey, yes. And he sets the standard very high. Read the Sermon on the Mount, especially chapter 5. And yet with him, obedience is rest. Now, how can that be? How can obedience be rest? Because this is not religion. You see, every human religion judges you on your performance. So, add up your good deeds and your bad deeds. Add them up, add them up, and if there's more on the good side, you might just get into paradise or heaven. Or, Good karma versus bad karma. If the balance is positive, you stand a chance of a better reincarnation. You are measured by your performance. Religion measures you by your performance. Religion like that is a burden. It's a heavy load on your shoulders. Perform or you are rejected. Perform or you fail. The way of Jesus is utterly different. The way of Jesus is grace. Jesus opens his arms and he says, come to me with all your burdens, all your worries, all your struggles, all your pain, and I'll carry those. And I will accept you. And whatever happens, whatever happens, I will never let you go. And I will never throw you out. That is relief. That is peace. That is rest. So as we move to a close, it's time for, you, for me to ask you, do you know about this rest? Maybe you have always thought following Jesus Christ is really about being the best person that you can and, and hoping for heaven at the end if all goes well. My friend, can I say to you, that is not the Christian faith. That is performance-based religion. Jesus offers you rest, so why not come to him now if you never have? Why not answer his invitation? Confess your sins and your failures. Leave behind your life of trying to prove yourself and come to him for rest. And to my Christian brothers and sisters here, some questions for you and me. Are you worried about what God thinks of you? Do you sometimes feel that you have let him down one time too often, that he can't possibly still want you on his team? He can't possibly still love you like that? No, Jesus is looking at you and me right now, and he's saying, Keep coming to me, humble and gentle as I am. Enjoy my rest. God has not stopped loving you. God has not given up on you. He has not and he never will. Or are we, and this is 
perhaps what I most need to hear. Are we living our Christian life as if it was like building our spiritual CV? A track record of exam grades and successful tasks and good performance to offer to God in part payment for our salvation. That drive to perform is embedded in us so deeply, has been there ever since the fall. We simply cannot believe in God's grace and his goodness. But this is the good news. We can believe it. And my friends, the Lord does not judge us by our performance. God is not sitting there reading your spiritual CV, preparing to interview you for heaven. Your place is unconditional and secure. Of course, he wants us to serve him. But out of love, not to win his acceptance, not to score points. Never that. The place we are accepted is not our work, but in his work. The work that he has already done for us. The humble work of Jesus on the cross. That settled your acceptance and mine once and for all. We look at the Lord Jesus and love him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Isn't this good news? Um, what I really want to encourage us to do now is is to respond to this that actually this is church this is an easy an easy thing for us to respond to that's what jesus is saying this is it's not it's not about our works it's not you know this is easy for us to to come so i want to encourage you the prayer team will be um i think over there now i think mark and ade will go up to the uh, balcony to pray for people for, for healing that doesn't need to be physical healing that could be you know emotional that could be spiritual um, I really encourage you now, church, to respond to this, to this good news. Um, as a band, we'll, we'll play um, quietly for a while and then we'll join for our final song. want to pray with someone next to you feel free to if you want to stand and sing and join us um sing this song now you're also more than welcome to when i 
will trust in you alone. And I will trust in you alone. Your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me. Sing that again. And I will trust. You want to take a seat. Um, that brings us to the end um, of our service now. I'm just going to quickly uh, read a passage from Hebrews to finish. If I can find it, there we are. Um, I, I just encourage you, don't, if you are feeling prompted to respond, don't leave here without responding or praying with someone. The prayer team will still be there. Mark and Ade will still be there. Um, do do stay and um, respond if you feel prompted to. And we'll keep playing in the background so you feel comfortable to do that. Otherwise, there's coffee, there's tea, there's people to chat to. So do stick around and um, talk to someone you haven't met before. I'm just going to read this passage from Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. 
Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.